All right, so we're just going to jump right into it. Um, the panel for the session, Do That Thing, Reinventing Feminist Imaginations Through Feminist Creativity. Um, we have Kukili Swanila, Slindi uh, Ntembu, Katarina Jenny Dogan. Have I said that correctly? Okay. Um, okay. And Shveta Naidu. Have I said that correctly? Shvita. Shvita Naidu. Okay, uh, Katerina, I just want to please ask her if we, we if she's come towards us starting without her, yeah. before we start. And um, are we comfortable with the order of speaking? Order? Okay. Um, should we stop? No, I you can, yes. Alright, um, should we stop? Thank you. Um, good afternoon, guys. My name is Kudis Walila. Thank you all for being here. I'm very nervous. <laughs> Alright, um... I'm an artist and researcher. I'm currently doing my um, master's degree in art history at Rhodes University. And my thesis focuses on the tensions and possibilities of rituals in performance art. Um, but in this presentation, I'll be speaking about my own work, um, which I, I haven't done really. <laughs> um, in such a plat like such platforms and also Um, it started very earlier on the idea that I'll, I'll be sharing, the ideas that I'll be sharing with you guys. So it's a continuation. It's not something new. It's a continuation of my work. Um, but there was a time when it stopped because I needed to redefine um, what I really wanted to talk about. And so I'm also interested in writing about my own work um, and really creating my own. Um, like narratives around my work and not relying on other people to um, pick it up. So I work across disciplines like painting, installation, and performance, and my work explores the physical, mental, and spiritual spaces held um, close by personal experiences. I'm mostly interested in notions of narratives, memories, identities, which I use to create links between physical and emotional senses that are related to humans and animals. So with my painting medium, which I'll be showing you guys, um, my technique focuses on the appearance of skin, and this is sheep skin, goat skin, and cow skin. Um, the work has a unique intensity, um, which draws on the kind of vestige of, sorry, vestiges and runes of skin, bone, and fire. Um, so textures imply restoration, preservation, violence, pain, while presenting themselves as ember stillness of an archaeological find, which is more like a geographic surveying of um, surveying technique that I use to to create different ways of imaging and mapping, um, especially my personal history and where I come from, um, which is in the Eastern Cape, and also. I grew up in Amtata and then moving to the village and having to do that almost on, like yearly and um, growing up, we go to the city and then we're going home, we're going home and then we're going home and then I moved to Pretoria and now I'm at home but I have to go home mm -hmm. and then we left that other home um, <laughs> in Amtata and now we've moved to another flat and my parents are still stuck in the old flat so I don't know where whether I'm home in that new flat and then I have to call the other apartment home again and then we go home again to the Eastern Cape. So that's um, where I come from, those different homes. So in my undergraduate studies at the Tony University of Technology, we were tasked to come up with concepts that um, were, very, were very related to our personal stories. So this is where we were starting to um, for my themes in terms of our work and really start thinking about our art making process and how we're gonna um, expose ourselves into the industry using our ideas. 
And one thing that was um, emphasized in that project was bringing our family albums as a start and to share those family albums and photos with the class and with our lecturers and really unpack the stories that were happening in those images. And a lot of my classmates were bringing their photos um, of their families, selected photos, or the full albums. And then from those images, paintings, installations, performances, um, oh gosh, I'm nervous. <laughs> And sculptural pieces and print works um, were born. But I was uncomfortable in bringing my family album and my family history into that space. And it was also because of who I was presenting it to. So Tony University of Technology even now is um, predominantly white uh, lecturers and at the time it was mainly male um, lecturers and for me, I don't know, I was still young and still didn't understand the reasons as to why really I didn't want to share except for that I felt lost within that university and really to explain my family history uh, would be whenever I meet them, it, it's going to be that conversation where, uh, oh, she comes from this type of, type of family, oh, her father did this, oh, her mother is doing this, and all like that. And so, also me having to explain that um, and really share and unpack those personal stories that um, are in those images. And so I'm aware of the emotional aspects of family photographs and albums and their functions as social, as social tools and personal creations of identity, culture, and history. And most importantly, they stimulate um, these tensions between trauma and conflict, but also as sites of love and um, personal storytelling. You know, when you're sitting as a family and you're sharing images, and some a lot of things are hidden, um, which really um, are events that are filled with pain. But sometimes we would rather speak about them as these very important events that were filled with love and that we should remember all them only in that way. And so, for me, a lot of things that are also in those images are questions that have not been answered from, like, my parents especially. And so I've been doing a bit of research, like just reading up on albums. So mainly I'm interested in the album which an album has um, photographic images. So I've been looking at, the, at authors who have written about the album in relation to photograph, uh, photography and collective history. And I came across Susan Sotang's um, article on photography. And she proposes an overview of growing recognition of the importance of material and sensory communicative power of photographs and her her objective, her objectives are methodological, are methodological, are methodol okay, let me just leave it. Yeah. <laughs> it's fine, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> There's no uh, Tosa translation. <laughs> to explore ways in which photographs, uh, photographs operate as objects in telling um, of histories, occupying spaces between people and people and people and things. She focuses on the way in which uh, sensory modes of photography are beyond the merely physical and visual, but also there's this inter integral um, constitution of meaning and usage. So several scholars also agree that albums are common features, are common features in photographic cultures, yet they are seldom uh, written about. So albums seem to at once um, too commonplace, yes, yet also endlessly heterogeneous and difficult to classify. So historians of photography tend to reduce them to evidence of the consumption of snapshots, while social historians, collectors, and uh, our collectors are interested mainly in their subject matter. So what is happening in the photograph, for instance, if there are shops, if there are clothes, people wearing certain types of clothes, modes of transport, and human types and human types, like in terms of identities. And so in the book, Suspended um, Conversations, The Afterlife of Memory 
and photographic albums. Mata Langford argues that albums are seldom valued as objects um, in their own right because many historians focus on the individual photographs and little priority between um, being given to the exhibiting and research on albums within archives. And so Langford uh, pays attention on how albums create meaning as objects endowed with a degree of agency. Other careful approaches to the album have focused on um, similarities with diaries and gendered nature and their visual and semantic playfulness, scrapbooking or collaging. And so what I like about uh, Langford's text is that she focuses on, on this idea of oral tradition and that accompanies albums as they are shared with intimate friends, family, displayed um, to acquaintances or, or used um, to mesh new friends and relationships. So these conversations fail to create stable narratives uh, as the present as the present affect, as the present affects the way remembrance of the past is performed, and as the album is passed on um, to new generation, or even forgotten. So some of the text I read uh, looked yes looked at this relationship between the album and the photography. And another article that uh, came across was by Claudia. Michelle on the idea of visual, there's that word again, methodologies. <laughs> In her article um, titled Getting the Picture and Changing the Picture of Visual Methodologies and Educational Research in South Africa. So her work demonstrates some of the complexities related to what is actually meant by visual, visual methodology, showing, for example, multiple forms of visual data, including domestic photos taken from family albums and material culture, the multiple ways of working with a visual image, and um, also looking at drawing, uh, photo images, collaging, photo story, um, video documentary um, of narrative in the albums, which can include captions and more expansive curatorial statements. So, um, Two artists' work I'm interested I'm interested in is Santo Mufugeng, the Black Photo Album, Look at Me, um, which was produced in 1997. So I won't go into detail um, that one. And then I'm also looking at the Bohang Kanye's um, Gilifa Laga history. So this is my family album, and at the time. Actually, we had this album. This was the album I was supposed to bring to our class, and um, and we did we do have new albums, but this one was the main one that really captured um, me telling the story of my family. And I've recently discovered it um, a few months back. Um, actually, yeah, a few months back. And in, when we're moving in our boxes, like the boxes that we kept. And so, there's nothing really in the album. <coughs> we moved all the photos to the new um, albums that we bought. So I really like this idea of the album having nothing, no stories to tell, but at the same time, it tells a lot of stories in terms of the traces or mm -hmm. the memories that I still keep. Um, and also, like I've spent time paging through it, I haven't had anything. And what I also like about the album, I don't know, if I, I found it interesting in terms of the image outside. And the image, we never, I never really paid attention when I was um, growing up, uh, like the image itself in terms of this idea of like, affection and intimacy and it's a white couple in the middle of nowhere and it's a family <coughs> album and it's also a gesture that I, I never really saw um, between my parents and yeah it's also something that you hide when you have a boyfriend at home and all those things so this is this is just that 
So just to show you an idea of my work, so when I went, so since I didn't want to bring my album, I went home to the village in Dalangulu, Sugar Bush, um, and I was just looking around and so researching and trying my best to really find objects that I can bring and use in my project. And um, I remember a time when I was coming home from my grandmother's house and my dad like calling me and saying and whispering there were people already at home and then him whispering like you are you are you are like you move from a girl to a woman so we're gonna start a go for you uh, so go with your dress and I didn't ask like questions because at home um, there's no there's not much communication you don't ask you just do mm -hmm. especially when it's coming from my dad. And it was interesting at the time that it was him telling me this because I didn't see my mom um, at this point in time. And so immediately I, I went to the room, I, I put on a dress, which was the only dress actually I, I brought. And, and then I, I sat there and they did, they, they slaughtered the goat and did everything. And this, I felt like it was a summary of what was supposed to be done because my cousin had went through, had gone through the whole process of initiation and being checked if they are virgins and all those things Thank you. and so it was confusing at the same time I was sitting there with my thoughts and just laughing at the whole thing you know um, and laughing because not because I was being disrespectful but just having those questions like what are we doing here and just my parents do, do they even understand what they are doing and um, because I don't know that side of them, whether it's a religion, or Christianity, I mean religion or um, traditions, you just see them doing it in secrecy as well. So it's things that you pick up in the house and like when you're looking at things or um, when you move to the city, the character, my dad's character, I'll speak about my dad mostly, <laughs> my dad's character changes into this person who's, who's cool and who's um, okay with everything and then we go back home and it's all this and very uh, authoritative and being very like traditional about his position. And so I, um, there was this goat skin and I asked my mom if I could take it and she said no. And I asked why, again, it was never explained. She just said no. And so I was like, but so now what do I do? She's like, no, go get sheep skin. And I was like, okay, what's the difference? Um, no, it's better. At least for me, can be all day. So um, that's what I did. I collected um, sheep skin and I took images of the goat skin. So um, I started actually. Thank you. Um, and so I started collecting the skin and I brought it back uh, to campus and I started documenting it. So I was actually taking images and really um, using the camera to document the work and how it changed. In in terms of the colors, in terms of the textures um, that I, I, I started to see. <coughs> so this is more. <coughs> and so what I did, these are my paintings, and I started copying the skin. So I'd, I'd, I'd make grids from the photograph and I started to copy <coughs> the actual skin um, in my paintings and really developing it, um, the, the copying process as um, a technique. And so I continued with um, just developing the technique and really playing around with different colors. And mainly four colors that I'm working with, it's Ben Sienna, uh, Yellow Ochre, Black, and White. And the red that you see is the, under, is the primer under. So you, I, I use the red primer and then um, the other side is more like your blues and your greens. Um, and at, at this point, I didn't really know what I was, uh, what my concept was. It was just a matter of cop like just copy and paste, copy and paste. And a lot of people were seeing different things in the images, and they were asking me, "Okay, I'm seeing this and this and that." And I really couldn't um, affirm them. Also, I I couldn't um, really say yes or no. But I just accepted. If it, if that's what you see, then that's okay. But also. The important thing for me, it was also, I didn't realize that using the skin was actually um, me having to explain that idea of culture and tradition. 
right? As much as I didn't want to speak about my family, but actually this was much deeper than um, um, just speaking about what was happening in, in the images. And at the time, I believe that I was so confused that I didn't know. I didn't think I had a culture or tradition because um, of these secrets that were at home and so therefore we were, we were removed from a lot of cultural practices as much as you were just told it's happening now, so let's do it. Um, and then um, after that, when you ask questions, nothing is explained. And so I, for the longest time, I thought uh, for me, it was really not my position to speak uh, and about my culture, except that I'm Kosa, or what is happening um, in my culture. And me, and how I defined that was based on my family. I didn't want to speak like about what other people were doing in their families that I knew and they were telling me. And so, so I started to, to silence that side as well for the longest time. Um, for the longest time, but when I was making the work, it, like I'm seeing it now that it was actually this, I, like this, I don't know how to explain it. This, this, a lot of things that are happening in terms of um, not me controlling the paint. Oh, the end. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you have a, a last sentence, I just, fine. Okay, yeah. then the, the idea of the skin comes from the skin. The idea of the bone, I started including animals and uh, human bodies into the work, as you can see there. The, the, I was really interested in anorexic people for some reason, like how the skin touches the bone and all the stuff. It was creepy, but it was uh, like it was nice for me at the same time. Uh, yeah, you just see my body go like a person just hungry, and um, as much as there, there, was no, there are those psychological issues happening, but I was just looking at the body and how the body between the skin and the bone. Um, so. Um, the idea of fire also comes from these now. I was, I was starting to bring in some reds and some yellows and some oranges into the work. So this is more recent work. Um, so this is what I'm busy with at the moment. And these are portraits. Um, for me, these are portraits. I see them as portraits. And at the same time, they are landscapes uh, of where I come from, Mission Kaboshi. And they create this idea of fire and just being at home and sitting around the fire and all those like um, stories that come um, from old experiences. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys. Cool. Sabon? Hi. My name is Lydia Temple. I am a playwright, a theatre maker, as well as a director, and I'm here at Bird studying my MA, trying to figure out my voice as an academic person. But <laughs> what I know is that um, I like to break, break rules in theatre places, especially as a writer. And I believe that the black woman's lived experience is not living. Mm -hmm. So I look into employing intersectionality in playwriting practice in order to fight or claim the voice of black women in South African theatre. As a practitioner in the South African theatre industry, it is difficult for your voice to be heard as a black woman. Mm -hmm. And how do we disrupt the patriarchy? And how do we end racism? How do we end gender inequality? And this is what I started to discover in the play that I created titled The Gamma, which uh, was able to be seen at the Babasati International Women's Festival last month. And what I did in that, what I did in that play was to show that um, we're not sticking to the rules. Black women are not sticking to the rules um, because I feel that the dominant structure of beginning, middle, and end is far too limiting to really show the complexity that we as black women experience every day. What is, what is going on right now in the country it's not a joke. We've experienced that from the past, we've experienced that from the present, and we're still going to experience it in the future. So what I really wanted to show is how do I intersect um, intersectionality through a playwriting structure. So as I've explained that I started to see how intersectionality is, is not um, a linear form. It's experienced, um, it's a complex experience that we go through. It's not just a gender thing that we go through once. Everything at once intersects into our bodies. 
So I had to create a play that started from the past into the present, then back to the future, then back to then back into the present again to really fully construct the identity of the female body and what the female body goes through on a daily basis. Uh, and we're all aware of um, who coined the term intersectionality. So this is what we did um, a month ago. So I had to show or map out the black women's lived experience, a portrayed through theatre now. And I use the title called Igano, which means name, which basically, who are we, what is our identity, and where do we fit in? And how I started to reinvent um, the feminist ideas, I started to look into refashioning feminist forms, where I classify the story uh, by presenting how the black woman's body in post-colonial society is not okay because of, because of the experience that we've gone through. And I wanted to break new grounds to show why women playwrights are fed up with what is going on and how they're claiming themselves in theater spaces. So I categorized four different techniques in creating the play Ghana, where I started to think about the black female body moving through text and what does that mean when the black female body moves through text. And I started to realize that if Sarah Batman was able to speak and if she was able to if she was able to um, speak about her experience instead of just being objectified and, and classified in a, in a sense, I started to think about how do I start the story? And before I wrote the story, I really wanted to start with the <coughs> tension that the female body carries. So there's a lot of body and text in the story. And to show how through history, we have not been able to place ourselves, or we've not been able to fight against the injustices that is going on in society. And I wanted to reject realism as I explained earlier, that there's no way that I can start the story through a beginning, middle, and end type of structure because we just don't fit in it. Um, so this morning we spoke about Molara of Anuga Lesley. And for me, when she speaks about the six mountains and how we move through the six mountains, um, it's not a pretty experience. Mm -hmm. So how I took it through playwriting structure was that um, the five women in the community are oppressed by the, the antagonist who I use in the story as a white dog. Um, so these women in this community are seen through objects that they carry. So one of the characters carries white gloves to show the implication of post-colonialism. And the white door that we always constantly are framed through, that we walk through, that conditions us to frame us in a certain way, was one of the second mountains that I saw through theater. And there's a character in the story who carries um, her father's shoes, but she's wearing her father's shoes to show the implication of child rape and child abuse, and how these women in the story cannot confront the issues that they experience. So a lot of the story is fragmented, <coughs> and you can't really piece what's happening, but they're trying to show you and they're trying to communicate to the audience that uh, the reason why I'm boxed in this community is because I'm not allowed to voice myself. I'm just trying to end this with you guys. Go sit down. What is this all day? So we walk through these doors and we try to identify who we are through these doors, but we can't find ourselves. And this white man has to take to, has, has basically forced us to act a certain way. White supremacy in, in, in its sense has conditioned us to think white, to act white. So in the story, the woman um, in the past speak in their present time or in their mother tongue before they were colonized and before they were washed away. So in the future, they start to become very monotonous and they speak in English to show how we have lost ourselves and we don't remember who we are, hence why the title, Ika. So what I also started to think about is uh, Mohanty speaks about how the word third world, third world has, been, has become a very degrading term. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to really theorize how 
she imagines a community of women who speak back to it, classism, racism, and gender oppression. So in the story, Ikaba, the imagined community is uh, these women are placed in a society that is unknown, but they dress the same in conservative clothes. There's not, a, there's not much happening on stage, but in terms of like sets, in terms of, in terms of um, what I show, but there's, there's uh, four red dresses that are hanging to show if you don't conform to the society, it's either we kill you or it's either we silence you. And so we move with the white door. And what the white door teaches us is that we have to become very calculated and pretty as black women. And when we move through these white door, we, we, we escape into the memories of these five women before they were oppressed and before they were um, marginalized in the space. And one of the characters goes into how she experienced a memory of being either raped or her body being um, forced upon by her father. So we fragment everything that happens in the story. So the women you see in the beginning are not completely fully fledged, if you get what I mean. They're still trying to figure out who they are. They're still trying to figure out what, 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 what where do they place themselves in the society? So I show a lot of complexity in the past, <coughs> present, and future. So we move up and down, backwards and forwards, to show why black women are just not OK in society. Um, so Did. Um, last year I was doing, I was developing the story as part of my MA, so I was required to stage the work last year in November. And the, these, what I'm going to show you now is what we really experience in Nika and what it's about. So just quickly. How do I play this? It's not going to work um, because it's on a YouTube. Do you want to show it? Should I try this one? I mean, you can speak to it and then it can just. So, what happens in this video is um, they basically unfold why the non-linear narrative and why the non-linear narrative is very important in contemporary serving the theatre form um, and why and how we disrupt time and what, what it means to disrupt time and what it means to go into different spaces. So I'm very much interested in how do I use time and space to equal intersectionality to find the voices of black women again in South African theatre or just in, the, just in South Africa or African or what it's called. Yeah, so it's
because I tend because of stress to speak very low, so if you cannot hear me, just uh, uh, My research lies at the intersection of uh, critical race theory, post-development theory, post-colonial science feminist studies, and curatorial practice. I have completed a graduate diploma in contemporary art history and a master of research in curatorial knowledge, and both of them within the digital culture department of Goldsmiths in London, and now I'm about to start my PhD at Lefana University in Germany. The topic of my presentation is related to my recent PhD research that resonates with many of the concerns that are explored throughout the conference, and especially the core idea and methodology of thinking and working through the epicenters of our agency that necessarily approach from a more situated perspective and a politics of, uh, at the micro level and the politics of a small area. To begin with, I would like to say a few words about my own methodology that I've been following for this research that can be best summarized as working with conditions and speaking with. Diverging from hegemonic positions that in their effort to assert their knowledge, speak about or on behalf of the base of the subject of psychotinomia, I situate my research within the idea of the possible study, which is a study that is not yet quite well constituted, exactly because it emerges to a set of conditions. First, as far as the study material is concerned, this practically means that it expresses to a certain degree my own situatedness in this project, which is very uh, different, and I would like to insist on that, from the idea of positionality. By that, I mean that the material is so dependent 
uh, on only on a specific set of conditions, but it's uh, it's to do also with my own position within this project. Uh, further, it is neither entirely informed by traditions, uh, namely informed by the West of critical theory, nor solely to do with African scholarship, but it, it grows in the middle. Far from thinking in terms of my politics of reference, mainly who and how we talk about, I follow this line of thought in an attempt to understand an entanglement of local and the global, where the whole is always local. My research project towards the cosmopolitical proposal, the colonization perspectives through the city to similar analysis, draws in itself a situated critique of the reason and the effects of cognitive universalism as the long-lasting effect of the imposed idea of a specific type of universality which as a product of enlightenment is very modern and historically competent with a specific moment uh, in European history. Mm -hmm. To be more precise, cognitive universalism is an infrastructural state and as such is more like an embedded perception rather than a site of knowledge, a lens or perspective that we are aware of. Within that vision, my research project engages in the task of problematizing the old Kantian temptation of inferring that politics should aim at the construction of a cosmos or so-called good common world. It is under this mask of universality and mastery that initially the idea of cosmopolitanism is right, predicated on the notion of constructing a good common world. This idea of David in relation to the historical conditions from time to time has been constituting the raison d'etre not only of the idea of civilization throughout the period of colonialism, but also of development and interventionism in the post-colonial world. At this moment, I would like to briefly refer to the fact that the idea of development came to take over in the 20th century, the centrality that the idea of civilization was carried throughout the 19th century. On a master's thesis under the name title, Made Voice in Over Silences, through an act of framing the frame, I tried to situate historically the beginning of this, uh, the beginning of the traditions of emergence of the idea of development, which was univocally defined so as the future success stories of westernization and economic growth, and examined subsequently the subsequent ramifications of the centrality of such an idea. Throughout my dissertation, I outline the way in which development is not only an approach of theoretical reductionism of economies, but also, um, sorry, but also a discourse that creates realities and ultimately an apparatus to subsuming other discourses propositions, uh, other discourses, institutions, administrative measures, scientific statements, moral and philanthropic propositions, among other, which is constantly formed and transformed through an entanglement of power and desire. One of the examples that indicates the way that development operates as an apparatus is to look at the way that it is re-articulated old racial hierarchies under new labels and woven to predictive uh, composed by all the new elements through which the post-colonial world became known, especially among the so-called developed world, succeeding thus in overriding gesture. As Denise Ferreira da Silva notes in relation to her notion of analytics of raciality, the racial world, uh, the racial would become an attribute of bodies and minds which fail to achieve the degree of development proper to modern conditions. Contemplating on the fact that the idea of economic convergence that development and modernization have been carried within them may well be the last remnant of the high modernist idea that constitutes that continues to thrive within the dominant contemporary discourse of globalization, producing uniformity and necessarily an impoverished knowledge for an impoverished humanity and non-humanity. I attempt to focus on the need to scale down the, on the question regarding the nature of knowledge and move from a universal knowledge to multiple situated knowledges. In this way, the cosmopolitical proposal attempts to engage with experimentation and as an act of profanity towards the various minions that insist that there is no other way, envision what Paul Zane Cortez calls somewhere in advance of nowhere. The cosmopolitical proposal reflects the cry for a world to remain opaque, untranslatable into figures, and inevitably inoperative in the logic of the operation of capture and control through metrics and analytics. In this idea, Black cosmopolitics, far from any idea of black exceptionalism and perhaps closer to what philosopher Edward Lissans calls opacity, is more about the polit a politics of resisting any notion of mastery transfers and universality, putting forward, of existence, the, putting forward the importance of existence of multiple divergent worlds and fostering knowledge production and self-empowerment, enabling politics of world making from a situated location. 
In this context, the project explores on one hand the relationship between cognitive universalism and coloniality, and on the other hand, the colonization perspectives that emanate from the need to universalize modernity and elaborate on a world formation that is different from globalization. My main research questions, which I approach through a balance of theory and practice, could read as follows. How do the colonization perspectives seek to, and instead of concentrating solely on colonialism, we think in terms of coloniality and epistemic coloniality? And how can we undo this coloniality for to challenge the reason of cognitive universalism? As a brain site of modernity, its creation of environments of globalized realism and attendant effects and effects by engaging with local knowledges from situated locations. I approach my main research question through an analysis of three different parameters. The first one is about subjectivity formation in post-colonial Africa, where I discern three different moments. The first one is, is related to representation and subjectivation under the civilized mission, then the relationship between psychology, politics, and knowledge under the logic of development and modernization, and finally, psychopower and globalization, where the term psychopower is used to describe the power relations that operate on the capacities of the subject um, on the capacity of the subject that are constitutive of its psychic life, like attention, concern, anxiety, desire, guilt. The main idea behind this approach is to try to understand the shift in power with a transition to the modern political field and the way that technologies of subjectivation and subjugation become all the more invisible, operating through an entanglement of power, desire, and more recently, credit and resilience. Here, before I move to my second parameter, I think it is important to unpack a bit the idea of resilience which has been becoming all the more fashionable today, reflecting the temporality of the economic development of neoliberal subjectivity and the political development of a resilient citizens. It is more than true that resilience has become a ubiquitous logic after the 9-11 of strategy of risk management and as such it has become a key organizing principle. Even more importantly, in 2011, the World Bank, which in conjunction with the United Nations increasingly promotes resilience initiated a working group on social resilience and climate change, which takes social resilience as a means to fight poverty and overcome the weakness of fragile states, while the last decade or so, there has been a turn uh, on the bibliography in relation to resilience from, uh, from IMF, especially regarding issues of development in Africa and South America. In this way, it is not easy to miss out articles such as resilience is key to Africa's development. Subsequently, systemic organizational and political resilience is connected to personal resilience that becomes a new technology of the self. As Sarah Bracke writes in her text, Bouncing Back, Resistance in, ter in Times of Resilience. Resilience in short, and I quote, resilience in short is a powerful idea whose deployment spans the macro level of ecological and economic systems to the micro level of the selves and the complex circuits of power that connect and constitute these different levels of social reality. Drawing on this interplay between the macro and the macro level, I would like to refer to the second parameter that is related to the notion of the subjectivity beyond the subject, and through which I attempt to outline the what the <coughs> subjectivity of a generalized uh, equivalence means. In order to do that, I, I, I draw on environments of globalized realism and examine the attendant effects through the colors of the psyche, the sources, and the environment. Since subjectivity is not merely about subjects, and although it can be individualized, it can never be individual. The main question here is whether we can actually understand the suppression of culture, the miss and dismissal of local knowledges and languages as integral parts of social and economic engineering that is necessary for the success of an integrated world capitalism. Rethinking eventually the task and perspective of decolonization in a more holistic way, a way that resonates with the attempt to evaluate the far-reaching ramification of an integrated world capitalism. The third parameter reflects on the attempt to think through curatorial practice what an approach to decolonization through singularization would look like, engaging with local knowledge through collective practices and open-ended research designs and exhibition practices. Within that vision, the project has a double bind. On one hand, it explores the genealogy of power and knowledge relationship with a specific focus on cyber power and its effect on subjectivity formation, and on the other hand, it seeks to think through <coughs> curatorial arts and <coughs> logical practices that engage with local knowledge through processes of singularization. Some of the questions of the latter part of the research that reflect the feminist imaginary and creativity of the project 
could be articulated as following. How can we work towards a world making that is different from globalization through processes of decolonization that are grounded on indigenous methodologies? What is the connection between decolonization and black cosmopolitics and where does knowledge production and dissemination stand in this context? What can singular knowledge mean and how can they be enacted through the curatorial as an expanded field of practice? Subsequently, it becomes all the more obvious that the approach to decolonization that I suggest is less related to the fantasies of unveiling pre-colonial bodies and more pertinent to feminist interventions related to radical practices of inventing bodies that have a chance for life and subject their diseases, ready-made problems and mobilization in the name of global urgency. In this context, I draw on a critique influenced by post-colonial feminist science studies, situating my argument within the, the, the shift from the scientific to the aesthetic paradigm, and follow an understanding of decolonization in terms of knowledge, production, and dissemination, trying to envision what an alternative to the model of epistemic coloniality would be. Like. Thinking, therefore, how the arising from our specific epicenters disrupts colonial paradigms and rethinks the colonial methodologies, and get to the question where and how we find knowledge from a view from below. To that purpose, I want to focus for the rest of my presentation on my collaboration with the Buki Foundation in Ghana for the development of a knowledge base and center for textile and clay material that brings together contemporary art and weaving practices and can hopefully provide a paradigm of processes of singularization and singular knowledges. For the first stage of the project, we've been attempting to map the contemporary weaving communities and ecosystems of Ghana trying to put together the existing knowledge that is increasingly subject to extinction. Drawing on the methods of, on one hand, participatory action research, such as focus groups and interviews, and on the other hand, indigenous research practices and projects, such as reframing, collating, creating, and disseminating sharing knowledge, have been working curatorially through a mode of alternative sociability that is oriented to co-produce knowledge in such a way so that people always have access to the means of systematizing this knowledge in ways that directly impact their lives. To that purpose, I've been developing questionnaires and traveling throughout uh, the country with my colleagues, collating the information for the first permanent exhibition of Ghana uh, uh, at the Knowledge of for Clay and Textile Center that is located in Wine Upper West Region of Ghana. For the purpose of the project, we've been drawing on methods of African history, which necessarily means rejecting the privileging of different sources and using instead a variety of sources and multidisciplinary methods from anthropology, linguistics, art, history, and oral traditions. Uh, since one of the goals is to think and understand textiles as spaces of historical knowledge, due to the fact that a lot of the textiles are named after a proverb or a historical event or even an event that has been important at the macro level of a specific community and is particular to it. This actually reflects the attempt to find new languages and ask for new where and how we find knowledge. Knowledge that is nevertheless not necessarily transparent or visible. Within here becomes the idiom or language to address the present. In this way, there is not a preservation of tradition as such or anything like a revival, but the use of it as knowledge in order to explore the present, where what is at the core is experimentation, especially through a more ethnological thinking. In this context, part of the exhibition will be devoted to the exploration of organic fibers. And in addition to that, the center will be offering residency programs for weavers and contemporary art practitioners to come experiment and work together. It is in this context that what is at the core is knowledge production and therefore the potentiality of knowledge dissemination. This is where we can understand the choice of bringing together this exhibition within a knowledge center and not a museum. The latter one is mostly preoccupied with issues of related to preservation and representation, and thus as a model it is more static, not to mention that it is also social and historically specific to a more, let's say, European tradition and Eurocentric um, model of control and power. The former one, nonetheless, focuses on not only knowledge preservation, but also knowledge production, and in this sense is more dynamic, as it opens up new spaces of experimentation and subsequently self power. In other words, it has the potential to transform rather than simply to preserve. Following a radical alternative to knowledge development as a, as a circuit, collective, a collective inquiry, <coughs> our interest has been and continues to be for the production of a body of practical knowledge that encourages another relation with popular knowledge. It is here where the potential for an epistemic break lies through the creation of a space for knowledge 
and experimentation that Roman can resist any notion of mastery, transparency and order to the exhibition that operates as an open space for constant research and negotiation. And on the other hand, accommodates innovation drawing on the present and remaining open to the future instead of being enclosed to a past. Subsequently, initiatives like this diverge all the more from a Eurocentric and very modern approach to preservation and they introduce critical thinking and social interaction in such a way that they disrupt institutionalization and develop platforms for anti-systemic education. <coughs> to conclude, throughout the project there is a general engagement with local knowledge through collective and experimental practices that every time produce singularized and situated knowledge. Singular knowledges in this way are not about an enclosure, a reliance upon their meaning, which is a meaning that has been constructed from a view from nowhere or from a view from above, but about the constant reenactment of their meaning, resisting any sort of simplification. The singular knowledges emanate from local knowledges that are remediated to the present through an approach of working with conditions, and as such are always plural. Singularization is thus not about the single liberal individual, or the unique object, but about material semiotic processes. Inevitably, then, the most important characteristic of singular knowledges is their authorless nature, whereby authorless I'm referring to the absence of both an author, so to speak, and an authority. Of course, they are interconnected, but what is important to understand is that the absence of an author is necessarily to other modes of knowledge production, other in the sense of different from the capitalized mode that inevitably leads to rigidity. In terms of authority now and concept, that resonates here all the more with the manifestation of possession and the entitlement. It is apparent that they have uh, that the very process of singularization of knowledge resists from within any notion of mastery. It is here where the radical potential of such an approach is to be found that carries the seed of decolonization. How? Through the real processes that set into motion new vectors of subjectification, which are not directed at a conformity with an established signifying order but bring into being other worlds through material culture and critically intervene into and transform the ethics and aesthetics of the globalized realities. Thank you. and I think that's uh, a good message going forward that we must continuously uh, disrupt the norm. So that's what my research seeks to do as a filmmaker, as a producer and a scriptwriter. I try to challenge and disrupt the norm. So um, my presentation is on identity through a post-colonial lens, a uh, post-colonial and diasporic lens. So it's an analysis of master of man um, in the context of hybridity and intersectionality. So I'm just going to play this clip for you. Move back and to kill, disassemble, make dead, unacceptable. You have made many modifications upon your person, huh? You have come a long way for the Defense Department prototype. You betcha! It's the all new Johnny Five! Just look at these items! You look, but you do not see! Killed amongst you, please. Where are you from? I am from India. That's your origin. Oh, somebody's left with the party. Say, you got a classic rare man. Yeah, in there, back next to the onions. Where's the juice? No, you're not missing the juice. Like I said, it was 7 Eleven. <laughs> Just be glad I did not buy a turkey shorty. <laughs> I'm Raj, I'm a Bollywood producer, I'm looking for the most delicious thing on the planet. <laughs> I just wanted to 
17. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, why this is important, and also my application in uh, trying to identify our space as Indian South Africans. Mm -hmm. So, as South Africans and even as colonized people, the consequences of colonialism has ingrained itself into every facet of our existence. Although we are able to explore such narratives of identity, we will never be able to truly define our own specific culture and regard it in the singular. Conflict of identity or the dislocation of self is intimately linked to the unforgettable history of South Africa and colonization. The aim of my research is to explore the development of identity through the Indian diasporic nets with reference to the series of Master of Man and to unpack the significance of hybridization and intersectionality of the Indian person's narrative within this particular context. Within the topic of cultural identity, one must revisit the popular conversation of colonialism. Due to the systematic indoctrination of the Western ideal and the successful elimination of our native culture, colonialism has effectively erased part of our core identity. With the recent release of the film Keeping Up with the Kind Samples, South Africans flocked in their masses to enjoy a new, unique South African comedy. The film had been well received by South African Indians as it is a film that represented the enigmatic nature of an Indian family in Chatsworth. It was relatable, funny, and a wonderful progress to South African folk. However, it did not deliver as an accurate portrayal of South African Indians. It had Bollywood-esque sing and dance the love story, the typical female jealousy, the vindictive behavior of the mother-in-law, and many other stereotypical exploits. Although the film had been a major success, and it could be considered a hybrid of Bollywood and South African cinema, the most impactful social effect of the film had that it, been, it had confirmed stereotypes, much like the nuances of folks. Mm -hmm. The issue at hand is the notion that economic success eclipses all other goals of a good folk, mm -hmm. and is therefore the desired outcome of many South African cinema. Very little consideration is given to the, to the societal implications that come from media confirming such stereotypes. Further to this, it is expected that we should express humility and love at ourselves in order to progress as a society. I do not believe that this is a matter of humility because it negates the need for interrogation into the complexities of the South African post-colonial identity. This is not to say that every form of art, film, or music needs to unpack the South African identity in a suffocating academic manner. It should only pay close attention to its value it has on society. This research seeks to unravel the art of approaching these topics in a subtle yet impactful manner, as seen in the episodes of Master of Night. The series in its entirety is an entertaining and is highly entertaining and has received many accolades for its refreshing perspective from a person of color. The show relies on its insightful and unique characters that aren't formulated by stereotypes and in fact confronts this issue as seen in the episode Indians on TV. In Andre Mazur's essay, he alludes to the film and the filmmaker being completely intertwined as part of a greater representation of place. He states, the individual transcends society, but society is also and above all within him. So there can be no definitive criticism of genius or talent, which does not first take into consideration the social determinism, the historical combination of circumstance, and the technical background, which to a large extent determine it. As Benson points out that one cannot separate the individual, the history, and the society, and treat it as separate entities. Rather, all of these factors govern their narrative. Therefore, forms that promote the location and the culture in which it is set have a greater social responsibility to ensure that it is an accurate portrayal and the true representation of character not defined by stereotypes. Stereotyping is a generalization of people and events which is counterproductive to form search for individuality and authenticity. Keeping up with the kind of science had a great economic impact for South African cinema. Though we should consider the social impact it might have on generations to come, 
if we, t if we continue to mold firms to fit this economic template. Firm has a far greater responsibility than to create firms just for economic gain. My argument with this research is that we, as people of color, should create firms that capture the true character of our being as a means to correct many years of being subjected to the Western gaze. We should not confirm these stereotypes and degrade ourselves for the sake of popularizing our culture in order to fit in. We should empower our future generations to pay tribute to our ancestors that fought hard for the dignity and respectability we are privileged to have now. This research serves as an inter interrogation of identity of a displaced person in South Africa and implements the success of Master of None as a cinematic product to add to the narratives of people of color and their distinctive identities. There is a lack of resources within the South African film industry with regards to Indian comedy in film and television. That is not to say that there isn't such entertainment products, but rather that most are not readily available and aren't suited to the question this my research seeks to answer. In using Master of None as an example, this research will be able to provide a deeper insight and perspective into Master of None as an entertainment product, as well as a subtle approach into weaving academic theory of hybridization and intersectionality into its narrative. For the purpose of defining my argument, and in researching the topics of hybridization and intersectionality in the full Master of None, was an ideal choice. The deciding factors in choosing such a film was that the product had to be a popular and widely viewed film, written by people of color and belong to the comedy genre, and is a recent work that depicts our contemporary, contemporary world. These aspects aid the research, and as there's very few works of similar nature that have been produced in the past few years. Um, I shall start with a quote by Ngugi Wontiogo. Prescription of the correct cure is, is, a dependent, is dependent on a rigorous analysis of the reality. To unpack this episode of Indians on TV, uh, it tackles a deeper issue of representation. It also speaks to uh, both concepts of hybridization and intersectionality. The beginning of the episode highlights the many instances of the media's representation of Indians most of which are highly stereotyped in the frame of the American's viewpoint of Indian immigrants in America. Each instance features a stereotypical Indian accent, which enforces the concept of otherness, as explained by Baba. Yeah. The stereotypes portrayed in this episode supports uh, Homike Baba's theory on mimicry, which is understood as a practice of colonial superpowers in which they sought to consecrate their own Western ideals upon colonized, thereby reformulating the native's own identity. This theory is especially important to the analysis of this episode and is made apparent through the events within the episode. Ansari's character, Dev, is an aspiring actor. Within this particular episode, he auditions for the role of an unnamed cab driver, another stereotype, and discovers that his friend Ravi is also up for the same role. When Dev does, his audition and the casting director calls him to redo the audition but with an Indian accent instead. Dev realizes the absurdity of the situation and decides not to entertain the idea. He discusses the unfairness with his friend Ravi in a coffee shop. Ravi, a simpleton, confesses that he does the Indian accent as it helps him to get roles and therefore money. At this particular part of the episode, we realize the incredible influence that the Western media have in the continuation of their power. By continuously offering roles that fit the specific stereotype, it endangers all that consume these roles, because the stereotypes are ingrained within our psyche. <coughs> Ravi is an example of a fractured identity, one who perpetuates the stereotype, albeit unknowingly. Even though Ravi is an American, the only roles he has been auditioning for are for a typical Indian accent. There are seemingly no roles that allow for the freedom of individuality or that represent his identity as an Indian American. The films that Ravi and Deb have been auditioning for perpetuate the hegemony and white supremacist culture. Homi K. Baba mentions the effects of post-colonialism post heralds a new space, referred to as the third space of in-between, 
which is a liminal space of translation and negotiation between the colonizer and the colonized. This notion of the third space is expanded by Stuart as the third scenario as a means of cinematic rep representation of a previously marginalized and displaced indigenous peoples. The marriage of this theory is further defined in cinema by film theorists Solanus and Gatinus, as third cinema has a sole purpose of foraging a new cinematic language by representing the residues of colonialism and its contemporary forms. They infer that the cinema represents the bourgeois values of the Western ideal that a commercial audience appreciates. Third cinema is a direct representation of the effects of the colonial power that are enforced uh, by the Western ideal in the first place, <coughs> stating, in the anti-imperialistic struggle, the most gigantic cultural, scientific, and artistic manifestation of our time is the decolonization of culture. As explained, third cinema is still a widely consumed product, which is exemplified in the particular episode of Indians on TV. Not only does this further perpetuate the dominant culture, but it also inhibits the person of color's identity. Bell Hook's statement that the colonizing mentality promotes internalized self-hatred is definitely apparent in this episode. As Deb wishes to, I quote, have the roles that Bradley Cooper has. Although this is a comedic line delivered, <coughs> holds with it some truth that all good roles are given to white males. And uh, if further scrutinized, holds the internalized self-hatred as explained by Hobbes. Dib's character at this particular juncture is realizing the reality of the social injustice of stereotypes and typecasts in film, which is inhibiting him from progressing in his career. This speaks to the concept of intersectionality because Dev's character, an Indian male, isn't treated fairly within his own industry. Due to the lack of true representation of Indian Americans in the Western dominated field, Dev has to suffer through the stifling roles offered to him in order to make a living. Not only is this unfair to him, but it also hinders any empowerment that Dev deserves. As an Indian male actor, he, he is at a disadvantage disadvantage, as he is in a competition with white males, of which form part of the dominant culture. Further to this, Rabi's discovery that most of the Indian characters he has watched as a child and that he has aspired to become were actually played by white males, which is further disadvantage to them and their careers, because if they fail to comply with the casting calls brief for stereotyped actors with, the, with an Indian accents, the casting director would simply get a white male to put to play the role, as exemplified by the montage at the beginning of the episode. The intersectional layers of a person are what defines their identity and role in society. To undo the effects of colonization or to empower previously disadvantaged individuals, films need to transform their characters and to allow for the intersectional character to take precedence as it can no longer be acceptable to generalize and allow for the perpetuation of harmful stereotypes. Therefore, as people of color, we should not subject ourselves to the indignity of stereotypes and allow people to internalize self-hatred because of the patriarchal hegemony. We need to empower people through every medium to allow them to the ability to express their individuality. With the examination of popular series made by people of color for people of color, South, Africans, uh, South Africa's film industry stands to gain should they use the cinematic series as an example to create films that add to the post-colonial discourse whilst, whilst avoiding the detriment that comes from stereotypes. I've included a couple of films that uh, incorporate the theory of hybridization, the third space, and mimicry. And this is how we can unpack narrative as a means to interrogate our identity and our intersectionality as people of color. Um, I impart the little, the wonderful wisdom of the inimitable Chinua Achebe. Until the lions have their own historians, the history of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. 
I see this research as a planned application to my films in future as an Indian South African woman because I am not Bollywood, I am hybrid. This is not me. Thank you. Unfortunately, I cannot open this uh, for a Q&A uh, because of time, but I'm hoping that um, colleagues on the floor and also on the panel will be engaging each other um, throughout lunch. I just wanted to thank the panelists for um, their contributions, thinking about Lisa's, Lisa's um, contribution on tracing of memory, uh, moving through space and belonging, the idea of home. Um, into um, Slindilo's looking at linearity and how there is an absence of multiple understandings and readings of the self that all happen at the same time. Um, and Katerina's uh, very interesting also pulling from the intersectionality framework um, on um, single narratives, right? Um, universal ways of knowing that um, that erase the, the new languages that can be learned from it. And lastly, that um, the idea is Shavita. Have I said that correctly? Okay. Um, Shavita's idea of hybridization, right? Um, and how um, we fall into the idea of, of representing uh, these very problematic identities, right? And I think what was very common with, with all the, the papers was this idea of writing back into the archive, yeah. right? Um, writing back into the archive what was being erased. So thank you so much for your contribution. Thank you.